Good evening. I'd like to welcome all of you to this inaugural lecture of the Daniel Burnham Forum on Big Ideas. I'm Paul Farmer, FAICP, APA's Chief Executive. APA is sponsoring the Daniel Burnham Forum on Big Ideas uh, throughout the country over about the next year to examine the big ideas, the challenges, the opportunities that are facing America's communities and will face America's communities in the coming decades. Addressing these issues now requires new heights of creativity, attention, judgment, analysis, uh, and collaboration across the design professions as well as with many others. It's important that we have these conversations now uh, to help lead to America's communities toward a more just and sustainable future. To facilitate these conversations, the forum will include a series of lectures, some involving leaders of professions such as we have tonight, others involving uh, leading uh, academics. Uh, we're going to involve students as well as those that we think have much to offer to our professions. So uh, please watch for that schedule, as I said, over about the next 12 to 15 months. And tonight we're honored to have three innovative design professionals, each of whom leads their own professions. And one of the questions that we're asking through the Daniel Burnham Forum series is how the professions will have to change if we are better to serve our communities moving forward. So what will be the role of each of the professions in guiding America's communities? And what will the changes mean then for each of our professions? We'll hear first from each of the three presidents of the organizations, and then we will have some time for uh, questions and answers. Uh, each of the speakers will be given about 25 minutes. Also, we have timed this lecture to coincide with the summer retreat of APA's Board of Directors, as well as the commissioners who govern, govern our professional institute, AICP. So I would like to ask each of the members of the board and the commission to please stand and be recognized. Thank you again for your leadership for America's communities as well as, as our members. We'll begin the evening with Susan M. Hatchell, FASLA, President of the American Society of Landscape Architects. Susan has more than 20 years of professional experience. In 1974, she founded her own firm, Susan Hatchell Landscape Architecture, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Her firm specializes in the planning and design of public facilities and works with state and local governments and, and universities. She holds a bachelor's degree in ornamental horticulture from the University of Maryland College Park and a master's degree in landscape architecture from North Carolina State University. Susan was inducted as an ASLA fellow in 2001. Susan will be followed by Jeffrey Potter. Uh, Jeffrey, FAIA, is president of the American Institute of Architects. Uh, he's also vice president of Potter, a design firm with offices in Dallas and Longview, Texas, that he started nearly 30 years ago. His focus is on K-12 through educational facility planning and implementation. He holds a master's degree in architecture from Texas A&M University and is a fellow of AIA. Our final speaker then will be Mitchell Silver, president of the American Planning Association and a member of AICP as well. Mitchell is a chief planning and development officer and the planning director for the city of Raleigh, North Carolina, currently America's second fastest growing city. He has more than 25 years of experience working in both the private and public sectors. He has a bachelor's degree in architecture from the Pratt Institute and a master of urban planning from Hunter College. He's a certified planner and a licensed professional planner in the state of New Jersey. So without further delay, I'd like to ask Susan Hatchell to begin the first Burnham Lecture. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> I think Chicago is one of my favorite places, so I can't tell you what an honor it is to uh, not only be involved in this really interesting idea, big idea, but to be in such an interesting city with a great history. Uh, I'm going to talk about landscape architecture and the future of American communities, and I'm going to review some challenges, some emerging issues, and then talk a bit about the big idea. Uh, those of you who are friends of mine know that I post a Facebook theme song almost daily, not quite. Uh, and so this morning before flying out of Raleigh, I decided the song would be Chicago. 
by Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. Um, I saw them at the uh, DPAC in, in uh, Durham the other day. But um, I really like the, the sentiment of, from the song. Uh, of course, the song is about Chicago and not such a happy event. But I like the, the words, we can change the world, rearrange the world. It's dying to get better. I think those are really meaningful words for us to think about. So I posted that song this morning. Landscape architects, architects, and planners, we shape and we change the world in very real and very physical way. So we have a responsibility to think big, and we have a responsibility to get it right. The mission of the ASLA is to lead, educate, and to participate in the careful stewardship, wise planning, and artful design of our cultural and natural environments. So as we look forward to the next 50 years, 2012 to 2062. I was uh, speaking with Mitch earlier today, and I said, well, that's a daunting task, a person my age when asked to look forward 50 years. I kind of, um, it, it, it makes me a little uneasy to think about that, because I know the one prediction that will be true is that I will no longer be with us. Um, but nonetheless, it's been a, a really interesting experience the last couple weeks as I've formulated my thoughts and ideas to really think about that. Um, you know, what is the legacy of our profession? What is the legacy of me as a landscape architect? What is the legacy of my firm? And, you know, you just don't usually sit down and do that that often. So it's, it's been a great, rewarding uh, professional um, journey to be thinking about this. To me, landscape architects weave together engineering and architecture using the foundation and the principles and guidelines provided by planners. I see us all working together in this. And I think that landscape architects are ready to tackle the challenges that are facing our communities in the future. Uh, we have the training and expertise to work with natural systems, and our profession was founded on the principles of social and health reform. So let me talk a little bit about some challenges we see coming. And there are many. Uh, the biggest challenge, I think, will continue to be the economy. For the next 50 years, it will be yet another roller coaster ride. It won't change, because if you look back, You'll see, and this is a little bit longer than the 50s, you can see the Great Depression there, but it goes up, it goes down, and it yanks us with it. It draws us up and it drags us down. So I think, you know, we're, we're coming out of a really difficult time, um, and it's become the new normal. But if, you've, if you'll read um, The Great Reset by um, Richard Florida, you'll see um, that these, these periods of economic dismalness really create opportunities in other ways, and we really have a lot of innovation and a lot of new thinking and new uh, opportunity that comes from that. And, and in the past, the Long Depression and the, the Great Depression made really incredible technological, social, and um, economic changes. So who knows what's going to come out of this one? But I do believe there are new opportunities that come from these challenges, and I believe that you learn the most from times of, of adversity, and because it makes you try new things, think a different way, and just get out of your comfort zone. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes, and it just so happens again. This is Chicago's own Rahm Emanuel says, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. You really need to think about how to turn a crisis into uh, a learning experience and a growing experience and, and turning it into the next thing. But the, the problem I see with the economy is that it really kind of drives everything. And I'm going to the other challenges we're going to talk about are demographic change, social change, public health, urbanization, land use, and transportation. And quite frankly, the economy drives and affects all of those, where people want to live and work, where people can make money, um, you know, what's going on with public health, how people work and play. It, it really is all tied back to the economy. Um, so, you know, it's just going to be an overriding theme, I think. We're seeing a demographic change, one of the challenges that, that I think is pretty, pretty serious. Population growth, 49% growth is expected and predicted between 20,000 and 2050. Uh, an increase to 420 million people. That is huge. That is huge. Not only are we growing in population, we're getting older. By 2030, one-fifth of the U.S. population will be 65 or older. That really changes everything in the built environment as well. It changes our tax base. It changes a lot of things. We're seeing this rise in the millennial generation. They're smart, they're civic-minded, they're uh, technologically savvy. We're seeing a bigger increase in diversity all the time with this population growth. Right now, minorities are a third of the population, but by 2040, the minorities will become the majority. 
So, you know, we're changing very rapidly. We're seeing a huge change with inter intergenerational living, mom, uh, dad, not only do they have to take care of grandma and she might live there, they've got uh, college graduates and 30-year-olds moving back in and they might have younger children too. We're seeing huge change in, in how people um, are interacting as families. So I think this is going to make a lot of change for housing, transportation, recreation. An interesting project I want to share with you is the Intergenerational Garden in New York City. Um, Landscape Architects collaborated on this and designed a 31,000-square-foot uh, intergenerational garden for seniors. Uh, and the, it was affordable housing, and their next-door neighbor was an all-girls Catholic high school. So really a good example of bringing different people together. Another challenge is social change. Uh, some of this is good, and some of it's a challenge. Uh, I think we're seeing more and more of a desire for people to live sustainably. More and more people want to eat organically. There's a desire for livable, walkable communities. Uh, post 9-11, we now have this real concern in all of our cities about security. We have the 99%. I don't know that they're camping out as much as they used to, but they have made it clear that they are not happy and they want to be vocal about it. We have an older, more diverse population, as I already mentioned, and we're seeing much more public involvement and more awareness, but we also have new communication tools and new technologies to keep the public informed. So I think we're getting a level of transparency that's beneficial. But the public is, is more vocal, they're more involved, they're more interested, they want to shape their community, and they want to protect their environment. I say hallelujah. Another challenge. Uh, a, a project that goes with that public involvement is a, it's called www.neighborland.com. Uh, and this is really, this is what I was talking about. You don't have to go to a public meeting as much as you can use your computer. You can be at home to share thoughts and ideas and talk as a community. It helps identify goal um, and think about things. And then you can come together with spray chalk and stickers and various things to really find that public space to actually come together to really talk about it. And I think this has been, been a very powerful yet simple tool to get people to connect and start thinking about their community in a different way. So, you know, it's a really good example of uh, changing in pub public involvement. Public health. This is a huge challenge. It is a crisis. It is a real crisis. There's much more interest in, in healthy living designed for active living, and that is because we are so unhealthy, and our environment has been designed to allow that and to you know, perpetuate that. Right now, 66% of the population is overweight. In just two or three more years, 75% of the population will be overweight at a cost of $150 billion a year. That's crazy. That needs to change. We see children with diabetes. Uh, the, the, the health crisis is incredible, and it's directly related to our built environment in many, many circumstances. We can overcome this. The aging population, people are getting older, but they want to stay uh, actively involved. I don't know about how many friends you know who are uh, right in my age range, hip replacements, knee replacements, all these good things, because they refuse to, to give up their sports. But recreation generates $646 billion in direct spending, either on gear or on trips, and 6.1 million jobs. The oil and gas industry creates 2.1 million jobs. Education, 3.5. Construction, 5.5. It's time to stop thinking about recreation about as, as though it's playing, because it's actually healthy, active living. And it's also a huge, powerful economic engine that we need to take seriously. An example of this is the Active Design Guidelines, New York City Department of Design and Construction put this together to look at the manual. How do you create healthier buildings, streets, urban spaces? Uh, it's based on real academic research, best practices in the field. Um, and it was developed with a whole partnership, uh, you know, AIA chapter, uh, leading landscape architects, mental health and um, health professionals. Really a, a great way to look at how we can work to improve public health through the built environment. <coughs> Excuse me. Another real challenge is urbanization and land use. A uh, majority of the population is moving to the cities. We have a housing glut. We have vacancy in the suburbs. People want smaller housing units. They want more transit-oriented, um, uh, more transit options. They want livable uh, communities, active living. Um, and there is an aging, crumbling uh, infrastructure that goes with this 
urbanization. How do we build upon that? We also need to think about fixing the suburbs, infill development, adaptive reuse, green infrastructure, stormwater, transportation, things we need to be doing in the suburbs to make them better and to make them denser. I think we see denser development, transit-oriented development, urban open space, and urban agriculture as real emerging markets. And here's an example, again, of a, a project to uh, talk with you about that. The McAllen Public Library in Texas. I don't know if you've been there, Jeff. Uh, this was a public infill where a, uh, an abandoned Walmart was turned into a public library. It's a pretty huge public library. It's the size of two and a half football fields. But this new library has increased user registration 23% in the first month. And it's created a whole new opportunity for programs, and it's been able to engage teens in a way that maybe the Walmart didn't. Transportation is a real challenge, and it's, a, it's definitely um, something we need to be looking at closer. Congestion continues to just get worse and worse as more and more people are moving into these urban areas. The cost of transportation is a huge challenge as well. This, it's the second largest cost in an American home. About 19% of our incomes generally go to some form of transportation. And more, you know, really importantly, it becomes a barrier to home ownership. For lower income people, they can't even afford a home because they're putting their money into transportation. Rising fuel costs do increase the interest in alternatives, which is a good thing. Um, the other problem with transportation is access and equity issues. Uh, the location of the quality of transit stops, the hours of operation, the distance from housing, and really it comes down to the elderly, the lower income, and the disabled people really holding the short end of the stick on this. I think we're seeing alternative energy, public transit, alternative transportation, transit oriented development, and they're big issues in, in pretty much all cities all across the, the country. The example I want to talk about here is back in Durham, the American Tobacco Trail. Um, and this is 23 miles of an existing transportation infrastructure. It was the railroad that took uh, the tobacco to Durham. Of course, Durham no longer makes cigarettes downtown, but there was infrastructure, and it was a great idea. It goes through urban, suburban, and rural areas, so it really is a safe and um, easy access. You can get to recreation, schools, businesses, shopping, downtown Durham. It's a great idea. And in the U.S., over 19,000 miles of abandoned rail lines have been turned into uh, walking trails and bike trails. And this is a huge economic impact to communities to have these facilities. So let's talk a minute about emerging issues. The first emerging issue, sustainability in the environment, um, one of the most important things we see going on is talking about energy. Uh, there's a lot of concern about dependence on foreign oil. There's a lot of concern about the safety and the environmental hazards with offshore drilling and fracking. In North Carolina, these are both big issues. But we also see things happening with wind power and solar power, geothermal and biofuels, uh, thinking about how we can do things differently. And I think design professionals need to step up and be very involved in this and need to continue to look at how to save energy and incorporate alternative energy into our, our, uh, into our communities. The example project here, I just love this one, Marina South Gardens in Singapore. These 18 super trees <clears throat> serve as towering vertical gardens. They collect rainwater, they generate solar power, and then they act as venting ducts to get the hot air out of the conservatories. What a great idea. They're functional, they're innovative, they're environmentally friendly, and guess what? They're also beautiful. Climate change and disaster response. This is really an enormously hot topic. Uh, we, it is a very hot, hot topic. You guys, I mean, I'm in North Carolina, we had record-breaking heat. Um, and I know you have had the same problem. The whole country is having a huge problem with urban heat gain, increases in severe weather, and sea level change. But of course, North Carolina doesn't believe in sea level change either, I, I have to, I, I fear. But, um, but green infrastructure, increasing shade, uh, designing to accommodate flood water, these are becoming very, very important parts of our communities and our urban fabric. And the um, the population, the, the coastal areas of the, of the United States, um, is the contiguous not United States, is 17% coast. Yet one, over a half 
of the population lives in that 17% of land that is at risk. This is going to create housing changes. Uh, we have damaging floods. Um, there's loss of property, neighborhoods, even cities. We need to look at uh, some of our neighbors in the Netherlands and other places um, where, where you can look at how to, how to address this and what can happen with, uh, you know, these are amphibious houses, actually. Um, I, was, is it Jersey City? I think 35% is below sea level. I mean, the, there's, there's some shocking, uh, if you've ever seen the pictures of Galveston, all across the country there are really major cities that are right in harm's way from flooding. And if you add a severe storm to that, it's catastrophic. Speaking of catastrophic, uh, we had the oil spill in the Gulf Coast. That caused people to start rebuilding wetlands. We had Hurricane Katrina, again on the Gulf Coast. People are starting to look at building green infrastructure, increasing the resiliency of the area. The tsunami in Japan was devastating. Um, landscape architects have been collaborating with other design professionals, designing new seawalls, looking at memorials and uh, monuments. The whole new emerging trend for disaster tourism it's there. And there's still a huge debris cleanup. Uh, there's a big mess to clean up. An example project here is the river to Bayou, um, the Bayou uh, Bienvenue, and the Lower Ninth Ward. It's pretty well known that what happened in the Lower Ninth Ward was a failure of levees, but it was directly related to uh, pre existing environmental degradation. There used to be 30,000 acres of cypress forest that absorbed that flood and protected the city from storm surge. It's not there anymore. This is a great project. It restores a resilient, natural environment to allow flood storage while still giving sustainable human development in the same areas. Really um, a, a great way to look at this. Another emerging issue is these mega regions, the growth of mega regions. I know you've heard about this. Uh, America 2050 group states that between 20, 2000 and 2050, more than 70 percent of the population growth and 80% of economic growth are going to take place in these 10 metropolitan areas called mega regions. You can see them there, and we're in one of them now. Um, so this creates an opportunity, but it also creates some challenges. As that population continues to grow in those areas, we get more congestion, more problems in an aging infrastructure. Uh, but it also creates a push and a need for regional planning, high speed rail truck-only toll roads, and looking at global integration zones that really help us be more competitive in, in this global economy we let now live in. So what's the big idea? I think for landscape architects, the new big idea is the Sustainable Sites Initiative. Um, the ASLA partnered with the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center and the U.S. Botanic Garden to create a new system for rating site projects and credentialing professionals. And you can see by the list here, global climate regulation, local climate regulation, air and water cleansing, water supply and regulation, erosion, sediment control, hazard mitigation from flooding, drought, wildflower, pollination, habitat functions, waste decomposition treatment, human health and well-being benefits, food and renewable non-food products, and cultural benefits. This goes a lot farther than that section in Leeds. It's called Sustainable Sites. There are 59 pilot, 159 pilot projects right now across the U.S. and uh, some other places to test and see how this system will work. Make sure that, it's, uh, that it's, it has viability. Is it, is it rigorous enough? Is it too rigorous? Is it practical? Is it user-friendly? What types of projects will it work for various things? Um, it was modeled after LEED, and it, the benchmarks include 15 prerequisites, 52 credits. Um, and the goal is to make use of sustainable planning, design, and maintenance. And the first three projects were, uh, you can see there on the right, were um, certified and uh, this past January. And the whole system is going to be launched next year. So what's the big, uh, the big idea here? Um, like I said, I think really this is going to be really new and exciting for landscape architects and others. But 50 years from now, it's going to be old news. It's going to be yesterday's news. And this will become standard design practice that really changes and shapes our communities and our environment in a positive way. 
Some other things the ASLA has been working to do is to create, educate, advocate, and collaborate. Creating public awareness and understanding. There's a, a I think the public has grown up with us and they're getting there, but you know, continually making sure the public understands what the issues are. Educating about the environment and the role of landscape architecture. Advocating to elected officials about important policy changes and where they're making mistakes and where they're getting it right where they can help create jobs for landscape architects, protect the environment, and be, do the right thing for communities. And also collaborating with other design professionals, environmental stewardship groups, such as being part of this uh, panel tonight. In 2011, the ASLA website attracted 645,000 unique visitors, 1.6 million unique visits, and 5 million page views. The Dirt blog had over uh, a half a million page views. If you've not read the blog, it's really a, a fun, interesting thing to do. The ASLA is 16,000 members. So it makes me very excited to hear those numbers because it means our reach is broader than just talking to ourselves and preaching to the choir. We are getting out there very broadly with this message. And we are being relied on as a go-to source about environmental and sustainable issues. Our website has nine completed projects, overviews, animations, with 85,000 uh, views. And there's a wide range of coverage on these things. Again, you can see um, design for active living, uh, uh, infrastructure for all, revitalizing communities, the edible city. And you know, really, just trying to make sure people understand that this stuff matters. And it changes the world in a positive way. I think there are many many great challenges facing our communities, and they're going to require innovation, creativity, and big thinking. So I do applaud the APA for this initiative. I think it's really a meaningful thing. We need to be talking about this. But change comes to our communities incrementally. Maybe that's a good thing, because you don't make a big mistake all at once, but it also means we have to remain vigilant, and we have to stay on this at all times. We can't rest. I think our organizations do a good job of collaborating. I think we need to collaborate more, and we need to be more vocal, and we need to push harder. It will help protect our communities. We're all in this together, and our collective voice is will be louder, and it will resonate long longer if we take the time to sing together. So in closing, I'll go back to our song for the day, uh, Chicago. The last line of that song, which will be my last line for the evening, uh, until you start asking questions, I guess. Um, the last line of that song is, won't you please come to Chicago? No one else can take your place. Thank you. I'm tempted to uh, just say what she said. Uh, I, I mentioned to Mitch a minute ago that what might be of value is to make a matrix of the three speakers and the major points they make and then see which ones overlap. And that's a story going forward, I think, uh, for collaboration at least. Again, I'm Jeff Potter, president of the American Institute of Architects. Uh, very honored to be here this evening. <clears throat> the title of my talk is Mid-21st Century Modern. Speaking on, on behalf of my AIA colleagues around the country, and especially those who've graciously given of their time to join me this evening, even driving in from outside the city, thanks for joining us. I'm delighted to participate in such an auspiciously named forum. Daniel Burnham is one of the great heroes of my profession, most likely a hero to everyone in this room. His genius was founded on an understanding that inspired placemaking is not the task of any one discipline, but the skilled orchestration of landscape, comprehensive planning, and architecture. And nowhere is this understanding more obvious than here in this city. It was his great plan for Chicago, the first such document for the con controlled growth of an American city, 
that set the future of the place toward greatness. It's a journey that continues under his influence even to this day. With the inauguration of the Daniel Burnham Forum on Big Ideas, we stand at the threshold of what I believe and sincerely hope is the beginning of a new level of collaboration. Never before, and certainly not in my lifetime, have the design professions been so challenged to help lead America's communities of all sizes toward a more just and sustainable future. Never have these opportunities been greater to be agents of positive change either. The task assigned to those speaking at this inaugural program was to focus on what we believe will be the major trends, challenges, and opportunities that will shape America's communities in the next 50 years. And in preparation for my part of the program, I went back in time not 50, but 70 years to the 1939 New York World's Fair. And I sat down to explore an exhibit called The Building of the World of Tomorrow. Sponsored by the General Motors Corporation, The World of Tomorrow promoted what has been called one of the last great meta-narratives of the machine age, an unqualified belief that science and technology would lead us to economic prosperity and personal freedom. Purity and perfection that was the promise of tomorrow as represented by the fair's iconic symbols, the dazzling white Trilon and Perisphere. I was just a little surprised to see that GM and the organizers of the fair got a lot of it right. They projected a message that was in many ways prescient. The exhibition provided a comprehensive worldview that predicted a sea change in the way Americans would live, move, and build. But what they missed was the dark side of this brave new world. On the horizon, there were no clouds that forecast gridlock, energy dependence, or air pollution. They didn't foresee the impact of vast post-war urban renewal schemes that disrupted millions of lives or the decay of the inner city as the white middle class moved out on the new ribbons of highways that advanced ever deeper into the countryside. And I ask you today, consider five studied predictions that will shape our places and profoundly affect our work. First, the impact of the digital revolution on the design and management of our communities. Next, something both the design and popular media have seized upon, urbanization. Except in a more complex model today, I'm going to label it reverse migration. The third is climate change. Climate change on its face is hardly a new offering, but its downstream effects may well be. Closely related to climate change, but a subject worthy of very special focus, is water. And finally, a disturbing trend in the Great Recession, or as we'd say down south, the recent unpleasantness, has flushed out into the open the monetization of the public realm. Let's begin with our digital revolution. If you're expecting me to riff a little bit on computer-aided design, that's not my intention. My aim is to take a larger view posing the following question. Will your next mayor be a computer? The digital revolution has transformed our communities into vast reservoirs of data. Decisions on the allocation of resources, what gets built, where it's built, and how it's connected, will be driven by an unparalleled gathering and interpretation of data. Our communities are becoming ever more complex networks, measuring networks of measuring devices and systems, a collective intelligence capable of sensation. Can new technologies revive sociability and civic engagement and help create networked publics organized around collective goals or issues? Will these innovations lead us away from top-down or bottom-up to a new, more democratic form of peer-to-peer -peer interaction? Are we seeing a real-world upgrade? 
tapping into humanity's collective response to create places of beauty, wonder, excitement, inclusion, and diversity of life. Properly understood and used, this flood of information can help us design our communities to be more productive, safe, sustainable, and I think healthy. Used without a considered ethic, an Orwellian nightmare could easily be the outcome. If we're not part of the research and analysis, we will cede control of the design of our communities to others, most likely corporations, whose values are driven by shareholder equity rather than the good of the community. If we're not part of the discussion that develops a backup in case of natural disaster or acts of terrorism, we'll be missing an opportunity to exercise the historic mission that we share to protect the public safety health, and welfare. The second event that I've mentioned is the much-publicized phenomena of urbanization. The global proportion of urban population, and Susan uh, touched on some of these statistics earlier, has risen steadily from 13% in 1900 to 29% in 1950 to 49% in 2005. According to the 2005 revision of the UN World Urbanization Prospects Report, that figure is likely to rise to 60% by 2030. By 2050, two out of every three people on the earth will be an urban dweller. Much of the discussion in our media has been focused on the movement of people into the traditional downtowns in our cities. Even cities like Cleveland and Detroit are showing signs of new life. In the next few minutes, I'd like to suggest that in this country at least, movement has been somewhat more complex and that we who shape the environment need to look not only at the urban core but also at the near and distant suburbs. It's understandable why the focus has fallen largely on a movement into the cities. For one thing, that's where the media are, but it's a little bit more than that. Public health authorities like my friend Dr. Richard Jackson are part of a swelling chorus praising urban density. They argue persuasively that since inhabitants of high-density urban environments drive less, commute less, and walk more, cities in the design professions that shape them can, in fact, promote public health. Then there is the argument for sustainability. Just as an elephant is, roughly speaking, a larger, more efficient version of a mouse, Working in the context of urban density offers the design professions an opportunity to enable the efficient delivery and use of all kinds of natural resources. Harvard economist Edward Glazer writes, if you love nature, move to the city. Related to the first two advantages of density is the economic argument. At a time when municipalities are facing and will likely continue to face increasing demands on their bottom line, cities cannot afford to sprawl. Fueling much of the post-World War II out-migration of the middle class from the city was deliberate government policy based on the primacy of the Leave it to Beaver nuclear family. Dad, mom, a couple of kids, and a dog. It also plugged into a burgeoning desire of the middle class America to achieve independence to live and manage one's own territory, to pursue desire. The implications of this migration of the middle class out of the urban cores of our cities were vast for the economy. The use of natural resources, the welfare of our cities, public health, and even the relationship of the citizen to government as urban Democrats morphed into suburban Republicans. Taking their place in the now empty apartments and tenements were the rural poor and immigrants in search of inexpensive housing and jobs. Typically, they required more city services, but in the face of a shrinking tax base, municipalities increasingly had fewer financial resources to foot the bill. Many previously prosperous cities, particularly in the Rust Belt and Northeast, entered into decline. In search of cheaper housing and jobs, the urban poor and children of the boomer generation are today trading places. The poor are in search of cheaper housing and jobs, while ironically, the affluent and 
income children of those very boomers fully exposed to the world by media and influence are in search of their vision of independence and an enhanced quality of life, a search that has led them to the cities. In other words, the much talked about urban migration actually flows in two directions, into the urban core and the near end suburbs as well as out to the middle and distant suburbs that were the center of explosive growth, not so coincidentally, where the housing bust has taken its greatest toll. One consequence is already apparent. As reported last April in Arch Daily, for the first time in our nation's history, the suburbs have a higher percentage of the nation's poor than the cities do, and the suburbs have fewer services to offer. The solution, and I'd say our opportunity, is not to remake the suburbs into dense cities. There will always be those who prefer the lifestyle the suburbs offer. I'm from Texas, remember? Rather, in the face of all the talk about the reemergence of the city and our role in fostering healthy urban communities, we in the design professions have this magnificent opportunity to reimagine what the suburbs could and should be. As we think about the cities as well as the suburbs, especially how they relate to and reinforce one another, we need to keep in mind larger cross currents that are transforming our understanding of both. One such current is charted by the sociologist Eric Kleinenberg in a provocative new book, Going Solo, The Extraordinary Rise and Surprising Appeal of Living Alone. Kleinenberg observes that in this second decade of the 21st century, more than 50% of American adults are single and 31 million live alone. If this trend continues, as the author believes, this will force radical changes in housing and social policy. Ozzie and Harriet move over for Seinfeld and Friends. Nor is the migration to the city restricted to sons and daughters of the boomers. Consider the empty nest households that are downsizing. Some years ago, the New York Times ran a story based on interviews with elderly Americans who had moved back to the city. As one woman interviewed explained, in the suburbs, the only way to get around is in my car. In the city, I have alternative methods of transportation, not the least of which is just walking around. She felt isolated in the suburbs. In the city, the local grocery store would deliver food even if she couldn't get out. Services for seniors were within an easy walking distance, as was the hospital and her doctors, as well as her church and cultural interests. She felt safer and part of a vibrant community, whether she was walking down the street or watching the street from her window. The greatest opportunities for integrating the growing number of elderly into the life of diverse communities may lie in college towns with their lively cultural amenities and medical facilities, as well as the older cities of the Midwest with their substantial stock of underused commercial and residential properties. In an article that appeared last month in the Toledo Blade, Analyst for Clarion Partners reasoned that instead of being shipped off to the Sun Belt, the elderly increasingly want to be near their adult children, who often welcome them to live nearby. These are likely to be some of the challenges and opportunities we in the design professions will confront as we help our communities grapple with the powerful multidirectional forces associated with urbanization. Above all, in shaping a more just and sustainable future for all Americans, we will be in a position to help government, business, and the public square the circle of the quality of life and affordability. So far, I've touched on matters technological and sociological. The next phenomena is somewhat existential, that is, climate change. No doubt, Future generations will determine the true effect of pumping millions of tons of carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. Tonight, I'll limit myself to something we can all agree on. There are more of us in harm's way, a fact that has major implications for how we shape our communities. In the face of current regulations and practices that encourage development in fragile and marginal real estate, There are opportunities for us at all levels of government to develop an advocacy agenda that has as its goal 
reining in market forces which expose people and property to catastrophic loss. Think, for example, the National Flood Insurance Program, nicknamed Uncle Sam's Flood Machine. Meant to protect the public interest, the legislation, in fact, gives developers the green light to build on sand, literally. Passing legislation that curbs exploitations of indefensible land would be a rough slog, especially in the current political and economic climate. Our pockets are less deep than those with vested interests to maintain the status quo. Limiting how the land is used does raise the issue of absolute rights of property owners and will be challenged by the negative feelings some powerful constituencies have for any kind of planning preferring to leave the design of our communities to market forces. A more hopeful scenario is based on the tools we already have to protect lives and property. One of the most obvious is that we have the ability to design resilience into our communities. Key facilities such as fire stations, hospitals, should and can be designed to survive the loss of essential services in these sort of natural disasters. We call this passive survivability. The concept came out of a post-Katrina reconstruction conference held in Atlanta that led to a set of proposals with the title, The New Orleans Principles. One of these states that homes, schools, public buildings, and neighborhoods at least should be designed and built to serve as livable refuges in the event of a crisis. Other post-Katrina conferences pointed to the special contributions landscape architects can make in collaboration with architects and urban planners to work with nature rather than against it. Natural disasters are inevitable, but the harm they do is not. With more people in the path of increasingly common events, we in the design professions will be called upon to play a greater role in mitigating harm. Before moving on to my fourth phenomena in the list of five, please indulge me to entertain briefly the thought that global climate change is in fact real. I know this because two weeks ago in the Dallas Morning News, Exxon's CEO was quoted as accepting this outright, that this summer's fires, drought, and triple-digit temperatures and terrific storms are evidence that something is happening to the Earth's climate and that climate change is a reality. We know the building sector is the major U.S. and global source for greenhouse gases. A credible figure, the figure that we at the American Institute of Architects often use, is 40 percent. It's caused by buildings, not vehicles, but buildings. By designing sustainability into the places we build and by advocating for legislation that mandates sustainability, we not only cut down these emissions and conserve resources We enhance our nation's security by lessening dependence on imported sources of energy. In this effort, you and I are now at the front lines. If the past is prologue, progress will most likely come from actions taken not by federal government but by our cities, which have been taking the most significant steps to cut emissions. I was at the mayor's summit uh, about six or eight months ago here, just down the street, and Mayor Michael Nutter from Philadelphia said, you know, these guys in Washington, all they do is generate policy. Mayors build things. You know, and he was right. He said, if I don't fix a pothole, I'm out. So, uh, I, you know, I applaud the cities. If any of you here represent that, you're, you're, you're on the front lines. Let's hope it doesn't take 50 years to reach the goal of carbon neutrality, if we reach it at all. The last point let me crack the door to a doomsday scenario being proposed by a number of experts. They say the damage is already done, that we've set into play forces that will have catastrophic results. If this is true, there will be a massive displacement of people who live along our coast. Susan's already had that slide up. Uh, I noticed the Texas Triangle she had. Uh, we call that Dalantonio. Uh, the um, The people who be dislocated, where will they go? How will they be fed since climate change is predicted to have a devastating effect on agriculture in this country and around the world? If you believe such a scenario is plausible, then ours will be a role in the future national policy second only to the military 
If this is in the cards, we have no time to lose to develop a coordinated, humane response. The next point, access to potable water, is closely related to the issues already raised by the needs of a growing population and climate change. Since the shock OPEC gave us in the 1970s, much of the public discussion about the future of our country has been focused on energy. Let me suggest that from here on out, water and not oil will increasingly dominate the conversation. Energy may be indispensable to comfort and radically, although I doubt permanently, alter commerce. Water, however, is the necessary precondition of life. And this resource is being stretched by the needs of a growing population as well as climate change. To address a growing need for finite and essential resources such as water, various approaches will be attempted, including diverting water from the Great Lakes. Do you know that 20 percent of the non-frozen fresh water in the world is right out here? I think you're looking at the new Sun Belt. It's right out here. Building a string of desalinization plants on our coast and just simple water conservation. Each approach has issues. For instance, desalinization requires energy not only to separate the salt from the water to pump it, but to pump it to the user. It won't be cheap, perhaps not even feasible. No doubt I'm a little biased, but as far as I can see, the most viable proposal to protect and preserve this most essential resource is to design environments that not only capture water, but also to mitigate, if not eliminate, the effect of contamination by uncontrolled runoff. Whether the design professions or government, again, most likely at the local level, takes, for, takes the lead, there will be an increasing mandate for low-impact development that will follow projects from the pre-designed stage as sites are analyzed to the operation of structures that are built and the facilities that support them, including parking lots. Research and knowledge will spark innovation and yield rewards. The design teams doing this work will be multidisciplinary, and as such, they will have the capacity to anticipate science and policy perspectives as necessary dimensions of an intelligent design response that achieves high performance, high performance environments that exploit beauty and an instrument of resilience and adaptation. I want to quickly introduce the final point of the presentation, monetization of the public realm. By reading excerpts from a story that appeared late last month in the business section of the New York Times, the headline reads, a Georgia town, and I, I quote, a Georgia town takes the people's business private, Dateline, Sandy Springs, Georgia. If your image of a city hall involves a venerable building, some classical pillars, and lots of public employees, the version offered by this Atlanta suburb of 94,000 residents is a bit of a shocker. The entire operation is housed in a generic one-story industrial park along with a restaurant and a gym. Applying for a business license? Speak to a woman with Severn Trent, a multinational company based in Coventry, England. Want to build a new deck on your house? Chat with an employee of Collaborative Consulting based in Burlington, Massachusetts. Need a word with people who oversee trash collection? That would be the URS Corporation based in San Francisco. Unquote. The interview with the city manager does not offer much information about the quality of the services provided. That could be the bias of the reporter. I don't know. Instead, the interview is resolutely fixed on the bottom line, cost and how much is saved. Still, how does approaching the responsibility of governance as if it were a business build community? Where does the community gather to deliberate matters of common concern? A rented space in an industrial park? That certainly reflects an attitude toward the role of government, which is reduced to a matter of metrics and contracts. The attitude to the judicial branch hardly seems better. Again, I quote, even the city's court, which is in session on this May afternoon, is handled by a private company, the Jacobs Engineering Group, out of Pasadena, California. The company's staff is in charge of all administrative work, though the judge, Lawrence Young, is essentially a legal temp, paid a flat rate of $100 per hour." Unquote. 
It's not my intent here tonight to debate whether or not the citizens of Sandy Springs are being well served. What troubles me as an architect and as a citizen is the apparent lack of commitment to a vision beyond the ink at the bottom of a contract. There appears to be no appreciation or belief that there is a role for government as an instrument of the governed to invest in the future. Indeed, government is somehow foreign and different from all of us. This is corrosive. It eats away at the very idea of democracy. It reminds me of a line from Oscar Wilde, who offered this definition of a cynic, a man who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. More than the digital economy, more than the complex impact of reverse migration, more even than climate change and a scarcity of water, this mindset may pose the gravest threat. This notion that, that as long as we have our own, we have no obligation to our neighbors. We have no obligation to posterity. Unless the people we seek to serve have a sense of a shared destiny, a deep commitment to work together toward the goal of a more just and sustainable future, we in the design professions can do nothing to advance the quality of life of all citizens. I begin these commitment comments with a reference to New York's World's Fair of 1939 and what might be seen as the blind faith there's, there's a band for you, Blind Faith, one of my favorites. The fair's organizers placed in the wonders of science and technology. What we, the inheritors of that faith, have seen are the limitations of technological fixes to the great issues shaping life on this planet. Whether the proposed solution is a ring of desalinization plants, umbrellas in the sky, or an additional macadam and interchanges to relieve gridlock, Folks, I'm no Luddite. Technology has a place, but it must be part of the kind of big picture design, integrative, collaborative design thinking that distinguished Daniel Burnham's vision for Chicago. Is there an appetite for such thinking? Is there an, the understanding that ours is a shared destiny? I believe it is. I've been encouraged by what's happening amongst our new generation. There's an emerging grassroots understanding among young people that there are no quick fixes in the face of the enormity of the challenges facing us and the planet we live on, not simply for the next 50 years, but for the rest of this century. There is also a growing appreciation that what affects the least of, effect, least of us affects all of us. This represents a unique opportunity for those of us in the design professions, an opportunity to work with the emerging generation of leaders to shape a more hopeful narrative as together we engage the future. Before I close, I want to thank the American Planning Association for inaugurating this series. This is vision and leadership at its finest. Let my final words be those of John Ruskin. Therefore, when we build, let us think that we build forever. Let it not be for present delight, nor for present use alone. Let it be such work as our descendants will thank us for. And let us think, as we lay stone on stone, that a time to, is to come when those stones will be held sacred because our hands had touched them, and that men will say as they look upon the labor and wrought substance of them, See, our fathers did this for us. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey, for ending on a happy note. I was about to pull out my handkerchief and start crying. <laughs> uh, thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, this is a, really a, a work that we wanted to have a conversation with our members. Uh, we talked about lead, inspire, innovate, and now we wanted to put those words into action and challenge our members to really start to generate some big ideas uh, for the next 50 years. As we look back at the past uh, century, you look at the challenge, really it's a tale of two centuries. The 20th century, our challenge at that time was urbanization, and the challenge defined by this century is going to be suburbanization. 
And I like the quote from Bruce Katz. He said, if you love cities, this is your century. And we're seeing that unfolding really before our very eyes. Now, we're not alone. A lot of people are having conversations about 2050 and the next 50 years. Uh, Susan had mentioned America 2050. Uh, ULI's talking about it. APA just released a book about the megapolitan America. And we're thinking more and more about the next 50 years because people say, why do you think so far ahead? And when I talk to some of the residents when we have public meetings, all of us understand that one day we have to retire. At least I hope we have to retire, depending on what you're investing in, in your 401k. But once you establish a time and a date that you're going to retire, and let's say you're 45 and you want to retire at 65, it requires that you do something each and every month, each and every day, to make sure you're prepared for that date when you retire. It's the same thing as when you look at 50 years ahead. What do we need to do today? Excuse me, today? tomorrow, next month, and next year to make sure we're prepared for the future. And so we in the American Planning Association want to join our partners to start to have that conversation. Now, as Susan said, I'm going to try to make some predictions. I'm not too worried about the next 50 or 60 years because I'm not going to be around here to know if it's true, and some of you won't either. So I'll take some liberty to take a guess on what I think may happen. Now, I typically like to talk about some of these emerging trends. I will not discuss all of them. I'll limit my number. You will see that there will be some similarities among my colleagues. But what I do like to point out about this list is many of these emerging trends have never happened before. These are new. And so it's very difficult for us to search for examples about how do we solve these problems. As I often say, you can't Google to find these answers. These are brand new. And these big challenges require big ideas. Do we need little plans? Is that helpful? Sure, it's helpful. But right now, we're also demanding big ideas. I come from a region in North Carolina that was struggling and losing their young population. It was tobacco farms and textile mills. And one person, actually a group of people, back in the 1950s said, we want to have a research park. People thought he lost his mind. And they decided to move in that direction, and now... The Research Triangle Park is a global powerhouse and has transformed our region to make it, as Paul said, one of the fastest growing regions in America and always on everyone's top list of one of the best places to live and work and play as a result of a big idea. So I'll be talking about the next 50 years, and as you'll see, there are some similarities in our presentation. I'll be discussing regionalism, demographics, public health, water. Uh, I'll touch briefly on climate change and then talk a little bit about zoning and land management. I think it's very important that we learn how to frame the conversation. We often let the public and elected officials off the hook because we're so focused on the problem now that we don't talk about the problems that we have to solve, and sometimes that takes courage. And so we let the public and the elected officials off the hook Because if you don't discuss the problems that you want to solve, then there are really no problems to solve. And that's hard for a lot of us because we tend to want to look at what's immediate, but we have to start having conversation. And it will vary whether you're in a small town or a suburb or a city or a region. The issues may vary, but you have to start having those conversations. And I remind planners in our profession, this is part of our code of ethics, that we have a special concern for long-term consequences of present actions, and we have to remind both the public and elected officials that there are also consequences for taking no action. And I encourage you more and more that we have to talk about, well, we understand the consequences if we do something, but doing nothing is an option, and doing nothing has consequences. And we also want to encourage a conversation that when a public says no, when an elect official says no, when even our design profession will say no, we're saying yes to something else, and we have to have a conversation about what that is. Now, when we look at the urbanization of America, you can see how rapidly it's changing. Back in the 19th century, when we were a mere 5 million people and 6% was urbanized, you move to the 21st century, where now we're 80% urbanized. And if you move us to the 22nd century, and I remind people, a person born today can actually live and see 
the 22nd century, our population will be 570 million people, and it's likely that our urbanized population will be close to 90%. Today, our population is 314 million, and we have 131 million housing units. And if you look at how we're going to grow, by 2030, 350 million. By 2050, 400 million. And by 2062, 50 years from now, 438 million. And oh, by the way, the world population will reach 9 billion by 2050. So if we look at the next 50 years, the United States is going to grow by 124 million people. That's what's expected to be here in the next 50 years. And, believe it or not, we're going to have to find or absorb 50 million new housing units to handle that population. If you think about it, that's roughly about a million housing units a year that will have to be built or absorbed. And you don't just build housing. You need commercial and parks and roads and everything else that supports it. So the America you know today will be transformed by adding over 100 million people to our population, and the world over that same time period will add, will have more than 2.3 billion people. And if you look in 2010 at our both urbanized areas and urban clusters, generally these are the areas that you're going to see continue to grow. The rural areas, because of aging and other factors, you'll start to see decline, which is right now roughly about 60 million. You'll continue to see that decline uh, for reasons that people uh, prefer to live in regional areas. But just like Susan was talking about, it's very likely that our economy is going to be shaped by these me megapolitan regions. Uh, she showed the one by American 2050. This is the book by uh, Arthur Nelson and Robert Lang. And this book goes in depth about these mega regions and how it's going to shape our economy and growth and migration over the next 50 years. And to show you the example, and Susan gave you another one about all of them collectively, uh, I like to share this locally in my state of North Carolina just to show how important these metropolitan areas mean to our economy. Just in North Carolina, of the 15 metros that we have, it constitutes today 70% of our population, 75% of our jobs, and 83% of our state's GDP. The power in our state is in metropolitan areas in most states, the General Assembly and the legislatures are controlled by rural elected officials. And so we have to work together if we want to move toward in the future. So what I share with people is that we are really in this together. We're going to rise as a region and fall as a region. Within that region, you have to support your neighboring cities and towns. It is not going to be good for this region if you have a weak Chicago. It hurts the entire region. So you have a vested interest to make sure that the urban, suburban, and rural areas work together. Uh, and I try to share with people the office model industrial park, which many economic developers still believe is an answer. Uh, that's really fading away uh, in the 21st century. And it's more based on strong economies, targeted clusters, ecosystems in central cities, and a movement toward metropolitan and megapolitan areas. I believe it's been a planner's dream for regionalism, starting back in RPA in the 1920s, that we're going to move in that direction by default. Well, why do I say that? Property tax with the aging of America is going to be a big issue. Very often when people age in certain states, if you income qualify, you don't have to pay any additional taxes. And as you see those counties, those cities, getting more and more older residents, and if you have a weak economy, there's no way of getting some of that revenue to support basic services. And so what, and even, you know, in terms of just a deferred maintenance, which many cities are choosing to do, sooner or later that day of reckoning is going to come. And I believe that we'll have to develop new models for revenue or service delivery, or the option is going to be to cut services or consolidate. And one of the things that I predict is that over time, you're going to see more and more local governments first consolidating services and then have that tough conversation, do we actually have to consolidate as a local government? Uh, we just heard again, I think, of San Bernardino that's declaring bankruptcy, and I think you're going to hear more and more cities, not cities, but I say cities, towns, villages, declaring bankruptcy, 
or doing some outrageous things like Scranton where they're just changing the way they pay people for minimum wage because they cannot figure out how to sustain themselves without raising property taxes or finding new revenue. So over the next 50 years, planners need to innovate new ways to sustain their economies, and we have to play a greater role in the economy of place, something we used to do, but unfortunately we got out of. Now, something that we certainly share with my colleagues is the resiliency of post-war construction. This is something that concerns me a great deal. If you own a pre-war uh, home, that house was built solid as a rock. You kick it, you probably would hurt your foot. You may need to even break your foot. Uh, it was quality, custom-built, yet unfortunately, most of our suburbs in our city, 80% of our growth is basically during that period of 1980s and on. 85% uh, of our city is a post-war city. It's mass-produced, inferior material, and my concern is what, what happens when that housing stock reaches the age of 50. Will it sustain itself as that older housing stock? And when you look at the next generation of building material or even building codes, just at the Pan, uh, the, the Piedmont Atlantic mega region, we are expecting 84 million billion square feet of new construction by 2030. This is a huge opportunity. Rather than having larger homes, having smaller homes that are greener, more resilient, and can reduce greenhouse gases. So this is a huge opportunity as we're growing, and my hope will see greener codes, better codes, and better quality as we look at the next wave of development over the next 50 years. Now, Susan already mentioned this, so I won't spend too much time, but certainly uh, we're going to have more older Americans. They'll be living longer, more single mothers, fewer couples getting married, and by 2050, majority households will be single persons. The implications, of course, is that they're looking, both seniors and the younger generation, are demanding different lifestyle, housing, and transportation choices. They're looking for smaller homes, looking to rent. And, of course, the, S, the prediction uh, by Arthur Nelson that scares everyone is because there's a mismatch between supply and demand, they estimate there'll be 25 million single-family homes on the market with nobody to buy them because a single person will not want to buy a large home 10 miles out of the city center so there'll be a disconnect, and so uh, we'll see over time with that demand for housing what will happen to that. May it be the SRO of the future, or the, what they're calling now the Golden Girl suburbs, where they'll have a lot of elderly sharing a home. Susan also talked about, and for that matter, Jeffrey, about the changing demographics of America by 2042. There'll be no majority race, and by 2050, uh, these are the numbers that I've estimated what America will look like. Now, think to uh, I really think PolicyLink, uh, someone I've been working with, and I actually shared, uh, uh, PolicyLink shared this presentation at an annual conference, uh, that I wanted to share with you what is happening across the country so you can see graphically and geographically the evolution of this demographic change over the next, this one goes up to 2040, uh, from 1980 to 2040. So basically the darker the color is showing the intensity of the concentration of people of color, uh, and so this is 1980, this is 1990, this is 2000, basically 2010 is where we are today, this is 2020, 2030, and then 2040. We don't have it at 2050. Now this will be driven primarily by Hispanic population. We'll also see an increase in Asian population, uh, African American population almost flat, but there'll be a rapid decline in the white population but this is the America that we're moving toward. And if you want to see this graphically, you could essentially see the reduction in the white population, the last part down to 45%, and a massive uh, growth and increase in the Hispanic, I'm sorry, the white population and massive increase in Hispanic population. Well, what this means also is that I think there's going to be the rise of what I call the inclusive city. By 2023, minorities will comprise more than half of all children in the U.S., and this is the first year there were more children of color born than white children in the United States. By 2050, a nation's population of children is expected to be 62 percent, and a working age population is projected by, 20, by 2050 to be 55 percent. What I challenge planners and the design professions that we have to be at the forefront to help prepare for those inclusive cities and inclusive towns and villages and counties 
because of this change that is coming. You are an inclusive city here in Chicago. When I shared this information in Raleigh, people got terrified, didn't even know our white population had already dropped down to 53%, and they hadn't even noticed. So there is really nothing to fear. We all get along. It was fine. I also like to talk about present and future generations in market demand because their values and needs and aspirations will really define their consumer preferences and neighborhoods and cities and communities also are part of that market demand. Uh, Now, what I wanted to talk about is not just the ones we know about, but I believe in the next 50 years we're going to experience another three generations, which I'll call A, B, and C. Generally, if you look at the length of time of the generations, they vary from anywhere from 23 years on the low end to 13. So I just estimated by picking these dates uh, that we'll see about three different generations. Uh, The reason why I say that is because during this time frame, you're going to see market demand attitudes change, which we can't predict. We don't know what the next generation A, B, or C. Usually you you know, somebody tries to get famous, and right now there are a lot of people out there. It's the iGen generation. They're trying to get famous picking the name. So I figured let me go throw my hat in the ring and try to get famous too. So I named <laughs> three of them, and I'll explain the chart in a second. Uh, the next is going to be the next generation, because I couldn't figure up a better title, from 2013 to 2030. Uh, essentially, 2042 is a year will become a minority majority, 2062. Uh, is the year about 50 years from now. And so you can see that just generation is really going to start being born next year. And so uh, this is before you start seeing some of that demographic change. But they'll be basically a mature adult when that happens. Then we have this global generation. Uh, They're the ones that are born right before that 2042 benchmark. And this is where I believe we'll have more global competitiveness. It won't just be USA. We'll recognize that Brazil and China and other countries will be rising as economic powerhouses. And then we move into this new generation, which is this post-racial generation, when every child born now knows that we are now in a minority-majority country. And so you're going to see these changes over time that in 50 years we'll experience about three new generations. What that means is change is coming, and each generation will be defined by key issues, challenges, and opportunities. Markets will change, demand will change, planners need to evolve, and practices need to evolve. So please don't get comfortable in what you do. Constantly look at those trends and be prepared to change. Now, as mentioned about water, the U.S. population has grown 52% in the last 30 years, while the total total water, water usage per person has tripled. By the way, that is Raleigh's Reservoir in 2007 at the peak of our drought. It became very serious, am I right, Susan? In our market, where they had to make sure you did not take a bath. They actually had people sniff you to make sure that you did not take a bath that day. And they, we had neighbors checking your lawn, literally. You were supposed to call the authorities to they saw somebody watering their lawn. And so we'll continue. This is from NOAA. In terms of the drought outlook, Uh, This is now a phenomenon that's going to be with us, and I agree with with Jeffrey and with Susan that water is going to be a big issue. And look at some of the growth places where it's happening. At least 36 states are anticipating local, regional, or statewide water shortages by 2013. Looking to the future, more than one in three counties in the United States could face high or extreme risk of water shortages due to climate change by the middle of the 21st century. And that same report said that 7 in 10 uh, of the counties, of the 3,100 counties, could face some risk or shortages of fresh water, drinking water for farming or other uses by the middle of the 21st century. And if you take a look at domestic water use in gallons per day, the darker the blue is the more usage. It's interesting that in Nevada and places out west, and even Texas and New Mexico and Arizona, uh, you see a good level of water usage. Uh, So this is something that we have to continually make a point uh, in our planning to make sure that we understand both our growth patterns, conservation, and water is becoming a bigger and bigger issue over the next 50 years. I won't spend too much time on climate change or how to mitigate mitigation since my colleagues talked about it, but my point is over the next 50 years, all of us really need more courage and resolve to pursue big ideas to adapt 
and mitigate to climate change. This is going to be an issue, and I think we cannot be concerned with the politics because future generations are going to judge us by how we act today. We have that window to do something. I'm hoping it is not too late that we have to really step up and intervene and not be concerned about the naysayers that are saying this is a hoax. We have some serious work to do. And yes, I am from North Carolina, if you did not know, at least for the next four years, sea level rise predictions is illegal now in North Carolina. You cannot make a prediction that the sea level will rise. And I'm sure it's going to work. The sea will not rise in four years. Uh, it was also touched on about the rate of obesity in the United States. I'm concerned that the CDC is going to have to come with a darker color or probably a tombstone they'll start putting on each state just to drive home the point. But I think we all know that the level of obesity continues to be an issue. But this really is an opportunity for all of our professions to start working together because place matters, design of place matters. Same here, the darker the intensity, uh, the worse level of obesity. And so I often remind people that uh, the public health professionals and planners work together for a very long time, but somehow, I think Paul was saying earlier today, about the last third of the century, we kind of lost that connection. But it's time for us to come together, and believe it or not, the phrase in the beginning of almost every zoning ordinance says to protect the public health, safety, and welfare. And it's my hope over the next 50 years that public health professionals, planners, and design professionals will play a greater role in making our communities healthier. Also over the next 50 years, I believe that planning cannot just be an exercise of site planning, subdivision, zoning administration, or just a regulatory function. As was said, actually I was quite surprised that Jeffrey made this point. We are concerned about the privatization of government in general, but also the privatization of planning. We have no problems with consultants, but as I think as Jeff eloquently said, we're very concerned that government, which is a municipal corporation, that there's this attitude that certain parts of our profession or government in general will be privatized, that is an emerging concern. And I always believe for planners that if you want to show your value through long-range planning, understand your trends analysis, and manage uncertainty about the future for the public and prepare for the future. One of the things that um, I think we're all very proud of is that the American Planning Association put out a document called Sustaining Places. It's really identifying the new role for the comprehensive plan. And this is something I believe that will play a major role over the next 50 years because it's based on comprehensive plans meeting eight principles. And I believe that this is something over time that I believe is a legacy document that will really pave the way on how we plan uh, going forward in the future. I personally have a lot of questions about zoning, which was originally called districting, which came from Germany. But we've now had almost a century of planning, if you use 1916 as the first zoning ordinance in New York City. But we had our Euclidean zoning, conventional zoning, performance-based zoning, form-based smart codes, and now what I kind of call the homeowners association type you know, zoning codes. The question is, what's next? And I believe as we become more dense as a country, I'm not sure what's going to happen for zoning. At least the term may not be around the next 20, 30, or 40 years. I also wanted to point out that America supports community planning. That was something that just came out of a survey that APA put out. But my question to you, is community about a place? Is it about people? Or is it both? I think far often planners focused on place. And I believe as we become more dense and the attraction that people have for cities, it's about all of the above. And we have to spend more attention recognizing because the reaction was America supported community planning. A lot of our critics said that's impossible. I don't believe it. You know, Robin, Paul, please check your poll. It can't be right. But it was right across political affiliation, race, geography, they supported community planning. And I do want to make sure, I think the reason why is that it's related to place. Planning originated based on the notion of scientific efficiency, civic beauty, and social equity. When we look at the three E's of sustainability, the environment, the economy, and equity, planning is about people and planning is about place. And that is why I believe as we grow over the next 50 years, placemaking is going to play a greater role. 
the experience of place. It's not just zoning. People move the places because of the experience, because of the memories, because of the authenticity and the sense of place. And as we grow, placemaking is going to play more of a greater role. As I begin to close, I'm going to talk about some things I believe are going to be innovative over the next 50 years. And one is something that we call land management. In Raleigh, we were very concerned about not just doing planning, but how do we manage the 145 acres of our land? And so we went on this project to determine, using careful analysis, how much capacity of land did we have. And we found out that we had a limited resource to accommodate our growth, and we decided to implement something called a land management plan. We looked very carefully at our sources of revenue, something I think most planners do not do. And we recognized that the planning department could influence maybe about 39% of property tax and sales tax. And so we want to look very differently about how do we sustain ourselves knowing that these are our revenue sources between fees, taxes, and sales tax. And we decided to look very differently about how to sustain our economy so that we could be good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars. And so we took an analysis of all the land value in our city, Believe it or not, the high spike of the blue is our downtown. The lower blue spikes is our midtown. And now we're beginning to look at the value of land so we don't have to grow out and sprawl, which most places relied on for their revenue. We're now looking to go vertical and be smarter about how we use our land. And now, I don't know if you can see this, but we're now doing a citywide rezoning, and we recognize by rezoning that property, we're trying to calculate how much value will that create and how much taxes will it create uh, for our city so that we don't have to increase taxes. And in fact, North Carolina is one of the lowest tax places uh, in our state. And we are working with the council uh, to come up with a policy that is looking at the return on investment versus just widening a roadway to address capacity. So we're smarter about what we do, and I believe over the next 50 years, this is going to be done more and more across the country. Uh, America told us a couple of things, and this supports what I was just saying. The top priorities for planners today, job creation, safety, neighborhoods, education, and water quality. What concerns me is a lot of what we talked about today is not on this list. I believe we need to have a short-term plan and a long-term plan. We need to make sure we address these concerns, but we also have a conversation about our residents, about the future, because I believe they chose these because it's immediate, it's now, and what they responded to. So as I close over the next 50 years, I do believe there'll be more of a consolidation of local governments. I believe there'll be a rise of metropolitan and megapolitan America. Uh, I believe that more people will be a planning for the inclusive city, town, village, or small town. Uh, there will be change in governance structures. Uh, the possibility of privatization, deal with water wars, shortages. In fact, there's a water war going right now in the Atlanta region. Building codes, I hope, will be greener and address energy efficiency. The term zoning, I believe, may be replaced. and Design standards may increase because as we become more dense, people will be more concerned about the appearance of buildings. And my hope is that there will be an increase in smart city and land management applications, and there will be a new focus on jobs and the economy. So as I close, I want to share with you what is next. I'm very pleased that the chair of this new committee, uh, Jeannie Birch is here. Jeannie, if you can just, there you are, Jeannie. <laughs> uh, Jeannie will be chairing, uh, there'll be about a 12 to 15 month uh, committee. Uh, that'll be both speaker forums, forums, and online engagement that we want to engage our members to tell us what are some of the big ideas how do we talk more about the next 50 years so we can then start to be responsible, take some of the uncertainty out of the future, and really be diligent about our legacy for the future? Thank you very much.